So today we're going to be in Luke chapter 2. If you'd like to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. I praise God that this season is upon us. It kind of forces us in a good way to share good news, to be of good cheer. Uh, we don't want to be Grinches, right? You know? And so you kind of put things aside. And I realize that life still is about what's going on. Sometimes the holidays is difficult, are difficult for people. But we keep it in context. I remember the first Christmas without my dad. And then the first Christmas without my mom. You know, and, and we've all, and whether it's a spouse or uh, a loved one or something, we have those things. But there's a moment, with all respect to all those things, that we have to put Jesus first. We have to focus on Him because He came for us and He did all that He did. And so we keep it in perspective, even as, from humanly speaking, it's a challenge, it's difficult. But today we're going to talk about good news. Good news. And we'll start in verse 8 momentarily, but what is good news to you? Is it a clear health report? Is it a bonus or a raise in your salary? That's always good news, isn't it? Is it friends or families having a baby? Uh, how about the reconciliation of families uh, from hurts, different hurts that go on in people's lives? Uh, victory in overcoming some addictions. Prodigals coming home. More money at the end of the month than month at the end of your money. That's always good news, isn't it? I love positive surprises. Uh, th that kind of uh, just really fills me up in all shapes and forms. And also, a uh, good news that excites me is something that I've been anticipating getting fulfilled. That's always nice. That's good news. Another thing that I want to ask, uh, just another quick question, because these are tying into where I'm going, is what kind of words get your attention? You know, besides, hey, you, type of things, or guess what? You know, what causes you to stop, look, and listen? Maybe the word danger, fire. How about it's free? That's always a good one. It's free. You know, my thought on this one is that people respond quickly to the sound of their own name. You know, we love to hear our name. Uh, why do we love to hear our name? Because it's worth. It gives us worth when someone says our name. And in today's portion of Scripture, we're going to touch on what God thought was good news. And the word that his messenger used to cause people to stop, look, and listen. So I'll give it to you in a nugget. The good news is Savior. And the word is behold. Behold. So let's uh, look at these verses. At, uh, Luke 2, 8 through 14. Jesus, uh, guide us. May uh, you illuminate us even as we hear your word. Let it be written in our hearts that we might be living letters of yours and give us uh, uh, just uh, what we need today to hear for your good and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, beginning at verse 8, now I'm going to be working these verses uh, through the next couple of weeks, so that's why I'm jumping right into the middle here with verse 8. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock. 
And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood around them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Hallelujah. God's desires were coming to fruition, were being fulfilled with this angelic announcement. And it was to be for all the people. And it was something that if acted upon would be great joy, great joy. Look at that verse 10. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. Now, it's not that God is shouting here through probably Gabriel, but the Holy Spirit used the word behold 1,281 times throughout the Bible. You know that? He used it 223 times in the New Testament and 153 times in the Gospels alone, of which 15 of those were specific to the birth of Jesus. In the Old Testament, the word behold was a cry. And it was a cry, calling, demanding attention. But in the New Testament, even though the word behold is in an, is in an imperative mood, it's more like an invitation to give attention to what may be seen, what may be heard or understood. Basically, in the New Testament, behold is signaling it's time to stop, look, and listen especially if you've been anticipating good news. It's like he's saying, behold, listen to what's next and act on it. Have you ever really wondered what qualifies as good news for all people? Hmm? Typically, what may be good news for some wouldn't necessarily qualify as good news for others. Most people can appreciate, they can appreciate positive things that happen, but not everyone can enter in or participate in the benefits. Let's say your friend or a family member gets a new car. You're happy for them, but it's their car, it's not yours. Okay. Uh, what about a, a, um, a cure for a certain disease? You say, praise God. But what about all the other diseases that are yet to be dealt with? And, you know, philosophically, we always want to end the ill of poverty. But there are so many people who are not impoverished, you see. So is it possible that there really can be good news that applies to all people equally? where all participate regardless of race or sex or age or income level or location or culture? Is there something that no matter what the circumstance or time would always be good news for everyone? Is that possible? Well, the answer is yes. But the answer is to the question, what happens after you die? You see, all people are going to pass. Unless the Lord comes right now, we will have our day. And there is a question that all people ask. What happens when I die? It's good news for everyone to know that their eternal state of being can be secure, that it can be everlasting, that it can be in joy 
and peace and enveloped by love. See, that's good news. So no matter what, where, or who, there's good news that when you die, you can be with God. You see? That's good news for everyone. Now, the angel's announcement here, we're, we're going to take a few of the pieces of uh, this portion of Scripture, and then we'll go back and do the storyline of the Scripture. The first word that we have to deal with here in verse 11 is the word you. There has been born for you. Was he just talk, was the angel just talking to the uh, shepherds? Was he just talking to Israel? Or was it greater than that? Now, how do we clarify who he's talking to? You have to go back to verse 10. You go back to verse 10, and you see the words, for all the people. The word people here is a special word. It's the word laos, as opposed to the word ethnos. With the word ethnos, we get ethnicity, we get nations, people groups. But he uses the word, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit uses the word laos here. And that means people at large. In other words, it's all who are uh, joined in a common bond of society. It's people in general. In other words, it's all people. You know why? Because all means all. <laughs> so this was not just for the shepherds. It wasn't just for Israel. It was for all people. Understand that God is the God of all people. The gospel of God is that God is for all people. Okay? He's for all people. So what then is good news for all people everywhere all the time? In all, I, does anyone not have an A in front of Savior in your Bible? Because in the original language, the A is not there. It's not a Savior is born. It's Savior is born. Deliverer is born. Not a deliverer. Not a rescuer. Rescuer is born. Preserver is born. The one who saves from the destruction of eternal death and brings into a state of eternal life. That's who's born. It's not a Savior was born. Savior was born. Now, why is A in there? Because translators like to let the, the you know, literary style and grammatical flow put that in there to make the sentence sound, you know, flow the way it needs to flow. Added to that, is Christ the Lord. It's just Christos Kurios, the anointed one. Jesus said in John 5, 24, he said, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. The Christ, you know, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's Jesus, the Christ. It's Jesus, Christ means anointed one. Anointed means covered. In uh, Isaiah 61, it says uh, that he has anointed me. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and he has anointed me too. And then there's this list of things too. You know, when Christ comes into your life, it's so you can do because he covers you. He fills you. He anoints us. And so Jesus says later, he says, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. 
Do you know if you believe in Jesus, you shall never die? Now, I just said everybody's going to die. What's true? What's true is you may be separated from this physical reality, but you will never for one second, once you receive Christ, be separated from him. Never. We close our eyes in this reality, and it's an instantaneous open to his presence. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. The moment the spirit leaves the body, it's present with the Lord. So you might be separated from this physical body, but you won't die. The moment you believe in Jesus, this is good news. The moment you believe in Jesus, you've passed out of death, out of separation from God, into life, into presence. I'm telling you, that's good news. <laughs> that's good news. How many of you since that happened have been a saint? <laughs> Well, there's another lie. <laughs> you know? Oh, man. Because, see, we don't have to be good and, and, and try and be spiritual. We get into heaven not because we, we're good or do good. We get into heaven because of what Jesus did. And I believe it. And I received it. And he was my substitute. That's why we will not taste death. Amen. We will not. It's good news. You see, that's what was born. Not a Savior among saviors. It was just Savior. Anointed. Lord. And Lord there means the master and owner and controller of all things. That's, that's what Lord means there. See? Oh, man. It's so good. But this is just a baby. Aren't you glad we got the whole story? Huh? Imagine. Imagine the faith it took. But these guys, you'll see, these shepherds, when they heard what they expected, they were expecting this. And the reason I can tell you that is because in that culture during uh, uh, Jesus' birth during that time, there was both a, the Jewish or Judaism was going on, but also the Greek mindset, it was called Hellenism, was going on. And what happened is people, uh, believers, Greek believers, took the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, and they translated it into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. And in translating it into Greek, they took the word Lord from the Old Testament, the word that the Hebrews used for Yahweh, for the most holy present God, and they made the word kurios. That's this word here. What does that say? That says that it didn't matter if you were a Jew or a Greek, a Gentile or a Greek uh, or a Jew. You were anticipating God. You were anticipating. So the shepherds uh, or, and the people they talked to and spread the word, they all knew this good news is Savior. See, it's great. It's great. There's so much here. There's so much to un unpack, but I, I don't want to make this a, you know, a Sunday school class. But there's so much to unpack here. And uh, we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, let's actually, let's go now back to verse 8. So you got those two nuggets, behold and good news, right? And uh, now let's put it into the storyline, back to verse 8. And in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. You know how, much, how, how many volumes are written about this verse? as to when the shepherds were out there? <laughs> yeah, night is a common time. But it's interesting that men have written volumes about what the Spirit of God has simply chosen to emphasize that shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now, look, Israel has two seasons. They have winter and summer. 
And the, the winter months are somewhere between mid-October, uh, early November, to uh, mid-March. That's the co colder, uh, rainy season. And then the rest of the year is what they call their summer. It's warmer and drier. Now, the rabbis wrote that those, especially these particular sheep that these shepherds were watching, they were most likely the sheep that would be used in the temple sacrifices. And these shepherds were special shepherds. They probably were shepherd priests. In other words, that they were part of a priestly uh, service. And I'll get into uh, their situation here in a minute. But I chose uh, the dates that this probably happened somewhere between mid-September and mid-October. Now, the reason I choose that, if you look at verse 6 in the scripture there, it says, and it came about that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. Now, I'm, you know, we're going to see Christmas plays and, and all that, and, and what happens on the same night? Mary has Jesus, the shepherds come walking in, the kings come, well, magi come, everybody comes that night. Didn't happen that way. <laughs> you know, it's like there's no Santa Claus. <laughs> you know, don't say that. <laughs> okay, the... So, here's, okay, I'm going to give you a Louism, all right? I think that Jesus was born somewhere around the Feast of Tabernacles. That's weird, huh? The reason that it's December 25th is that's winter solstice. And that's the end of the longest night. And so here, light or shorter, uh, shorter nights and light would come. Yeah. Back in those days, uh, Christianity wanted to try and blend as much with paganism as possible, so kind of uh, adopted some of the pagan feast days or you know, various days, kind of like All Saints Day. Halloween, Halloween was one of those things. Anyway, okay, it's a lot to unpack here, but the fact is that uh, it wasn't a rainy time. The rabbis wrote that when the rains began, these particular sheep were brought inside. They were, they were protected because these had to be the, the uh, unblemished. These had to be the perfect sheep, the perfect lambs for sacrifices. So they were somewhat more cared for. Where in the summer months, they could just roam uh, the hills with shepherd supervision, okay? So because of verse 6, there's some time, and, you know, okay, uh, we'll still celebrate uh, Christmas on December 25th, hallelujah. But what's most important here? What's most important is that he was born. And aside from Mary and Joseph hearing from Gabriel, you know, no one else had heard about what God was doing here until now. And I love God's choice, don't you? Who's the first people besides Joseph and Mary that uh, gets in on God's plan? It's these shepherds. It's these shepherds. It could have been the elite religious ceremonially clean religious leaders. Instead, it was these shepherds. These shepherds who were actually kind of uh, ostracized by the other priests. Why? Because they had to clean the sheep. They had to care for the sheep. And a lot of their shepherd duties kept them away from feast times and festivals, etc. So they were actually considered as a lower class. So who does God tell what he's going to do to the common the common people, rather than to the elite, to the elite. And I love it. I love what God does. Don't try and figure him out, because 
you'll be scratching your head. Verse 9, and the angel of the Lord, like I said, it was probably Gabriel, suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. The glory of the Lord showed around them. Last week, remember, it talked about Shekinah. When I said Shekinah, I saw a lot of blank looks. Shekinah, what is that? Remember, that's the glory of the Lord. That's the manifest presence of the Lord. That's divine radiance. That's what, that's what they saw up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And this is the same idea. Look, in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, there was an angel, a glorious angel that came down, and his glory illuminated the earth. But that, the, the key is, it was his glory. Angels have glory. I mean, if an angel showed up right now, we'd be, all be on our faces. You want to try it? <laughs> <laughs> But this is the glory of the Lord. This is the glory of the Lord shining around them, enveloping them like a Shekinah presence of glory. It's a physical manifestation of the divine radiance. And what happened? They were terribly afraid. You tremble when you're in the presence of God. It's okay. He's holy God. We're not. It's okay, because he's so gentle. Terribly afraid is megaphobus, megaphobia, big phobia, you know, little phobia, big phobia, you know. When we lived in New York, I remember growing up as when, when I was a kid, we had this cellar. They don't have cellars in, uh, in California, you know. And uh, when we moved out here, I wondered, where the, where's the cellar? You know, but anyway, we had this cellar. And, and before you turn the light on, it was really always dark down there. And you got to go down. <laughs> you know, start experiencing the megaphobia, you know, <laughs> going down into the dark. Some people won't take the trash out at night because they have megaphobia. Afraid of the dark. Hey. They had megaphobia. It was terror. They were terrified. That's what this, these words bring out. And we saw that happen on the Mount of Transfiguration. But what they saw was terrifying. Gabriel was announcing in a celebratory way. He was ready to celebrate. They're shaking in their boots. What's up with that? Verse 10. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you the gospel. That's what this word is. Two words, good news, is the word gospel. You, euangelios amai, something like that. Evangel, evangelize. I bring you the evangel. I bring you the gospel. I bring you good news. I bring you good words. I bring you glad tidings, good tidings from God of great joy, of great joy. They're in megaphobia. He's saying you have great joy. It's, a, it's mega kara, megaphobus, mega kara. What a contrast. They're, they're afraid, and he's saying to the extent of the fear you have, I can give you great joy you would receive this message. That shall be for all people. As I said earlier, what are all people terrified of? They're terrified to die. People are afraid to die. But when Jesus died on that cross for us, he took the sting, the fear of death away. I don't know. Do you remember falling asleep last night? Maybe some of you have insomnia and you can't fall asleep. The cure to that is get one of my CDs. <laughs> You'll be asleep in no time. <laughs> See, the fear here, you guys, in the right sense of this phrase, is spiritual ignorance. Not knowing the glory, the spiritual riches that God has for you. See? 
The only thing I fear about death, I've said it before, is how it happens. I hope I don't hurt, <laughs> you know. Take me in my sleep, Lord, when I wake up. There you are, you know, type of thing. But I don't fear it because for the believer, death is uh, characterized as sleep, falling asleep, falling asleep. Amazing. So uh, they're afraid. He's saying, I can give you mega caras, mega joy. I'll give you great joy. Why? Verse 11, for today in the city of David, that's Bethlehem, there was born for you, not a Savior, Savior, okay? Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The gospel of God, as I said, is for all human beings. Now, initially, he came to the Jews, didn't he? In John 1, 11 through 13, it says, He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them who believed, he gave the right or the authority to become children of God. Children not born of blood, nor of a human decision, nor um, of a husband's will. Maybe they were a little chauvinistic in those days. But born of God. See, well, why did he come to his own first? Well, that's the way God wrote it. He wrote it that he would come, that salvation, that, the, that Savior would come from the Jews. That's okay. But it wasn't just about the Jews. By the way, when were the Jews first called Israel? Do you know there were no Israelites at the Tower of Babel? Do you know there were no Israelites at the flood? Yeah. They were first called Israel when Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, which could have been the pre-incarnate Jesus. Yeah. Abraham, who's the patriarch of faith, the father of nations was a Gentile. The closest thing to being what we would call Jewish was that he was from the tribe of Shem or the lineage of Shem, a Semite, but that was it. So my reason for this little hopefully sanctified rabbit trail is this. God is the God of all people, not just the God of the Jews, okay? But God has a storyline, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So what's important here? Not when, what season it was. What's important is who he is. He is Savior. He is the awaited Christ, the anointed one. He is Yahweh. He is the I Am. He's the good news. All right. Verse 12. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Think of it. A baby, not a full-grown warrior. They were looking for a warrior. God's plan is a baby. And these were not ancient receiving blankets, that these wrapped in cloths. There's two things you can ponder right here. The first is this. Travelers usually wore around their waist a thin wrap of gauze-like cloth around their waist. And if there was some hardship or something that happened, or especially if someone died on a journey, they could be wrapped in this cloth, okay, that they wore around their waist, probably, you know, went around a few times. With uh, Jesus' birth in a stable, in a cave, and no other cloth to use, no baby receiving blanket, Jesus was probably wrapped in Joseph and Mary's swaddling cloth that was wrapped around them. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, in cloths of hardship for burial. 
He was born to bear our pain. He was born to suffer and die for us. You know, when, uh, when they brought the baby Jesus to the temple to be circumcised, Simeon, who was filled with the Spirit, said, this child is going to be the rise and fall for a lot of people. And then he looks at Mary and says, and it's going to pierce your heart. Can you imagine you just had a baby, <laughs> eight days old, and you're hearing that kind of prophetic word about that? Well, that was because it was Jesus, of course. Here's a second idea, though. A second idea about what these cloths were is that these shepherds, as I said, may very well have been uh, shepherd priests who delivered and cared for and raised the lambs used for the sacrifice at the temple sacrificially. And these shepherds would, here's what they would do, they would swaddle the Passover lambs right after birth to keep the animals from blemish. So it's reasonable that the angel described Jesus as being swaddled so they could recognize the child as the unblemished lamb of God. All right? Uh, Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Hmm? So in either case, the wraps of cloths, regardless of which we think, were humble. They were humble. It was ordinary, and it was recognized by the common man. And another signpost for them would be this, that he'd be lying in a manger. Lying in a manger. A manger was a feeding trough, a f an interesting place for the one who would describe himself as the bread of life, feeding us. And he's born where? In Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. So, so much here, so much here. Verse 13, and suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, now, I don't know if they were singing or if they were just saying or if they were shouting or what they were doing, but we know one thing back at, in creation, at the glory of God's creation, Job 38, 5, it says this, the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. So they did, uh, there was something going on uh, in the heavens at creation, but now God's glory was being praised in the person and birth of Jesus, Savior, the living word. The word made flesh who dwelt among us. Verse 14, as we close. Glory to God in the highest. This is what they were saying. You know, there's no sound too great, nor a height too high when it comes to praising. Modest praise is not praise. <laughs> I remember the days when I was part of the frozen chosen This is how we praised God. <laughs> and then as I began to thaw out, I did it. Because not everybody could see this. Yeah. No shame. Matter of fact, if you need a visual, you know when uh, your parents say, go wash your hands, and then they say, let me see it. <laughs> Lord, look. No, clean. I got clean hands, Lord, because you made them clean. Oh, listen, one more. Praise is becoming to the people of God. Praise lights up your life. Praise will light up your family. It'll light up your 
surroundings. Let's be people of praise. Let's be people. No shame. No modest praise. Hip, hip, hooray for Jesus. Matter of fact, goes on to say, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. That's the best reading, not goodwill towards men. This is the best reading. And I like to play on words here. K-N-O-W, Jesus. K-N-O-W, peace. N-O, Jesus. N-O, peace. No, Jesus. No peace. No, Jesus. No peace. Isaiah prophesied of his name and nature in Isaiah 9, 6, calling him the Prince of Peace. Jesus imparts to his followers a peace which the world doesn't understand, nor can it give. When you overlook something, in Proverbs 19, 11, it says it is a glory to a man or to a person to overlook a transgression. When you don't die on every hill and make an issue out of things and let it go, it's a glory. It's a glory. Because why? Because you have the peace of God. Because you can let God be God in this situation. Isn't that interesting? Last night I heard a testimony from David Stenson. He was at a place in his testimony where he said he had to make a decision. And he goes, I asked Pastor Lou, and Pastor Lou said, God will provide. And then Den and David said, is that it? <laughs> and I said, yeah, God will provide, period. <laughs> Let's let God be God. Let's let him have his way, his timing. He knows how to handle our situations. Before Jesus' arrest, in John 14, 27, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. What does Jesus' peace do when you receive it? I have three things here. The first thing it does, Jesus' peace breaks down dividing walls. There are no walls. That's his peace. Ephesians 2.14. The second thing that, that Jesus' peace does is it puts an end to anxiety. Hallelujah. That's good news, huh? It puts an end to anxiety. You want me to sing for you? Why worry when you can pray? Trust Jesus. He is the way. Don't be a doubting Thomas. Trust fully in his promise. Why worry? worry, worry, worry when you can pray. <laughs> we did it as a duet to our kids. <laughs> we have another one, too. Cheer up, you saints of God. You know there's nothing to worry about. I'll give you that another day. First, Jesus' peace breaks down walls. Secondly, it puts an end to anxiety. Philippians 4, 7. It guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And the third thing it does is that people can only offer a temporary and circumstantial peace, but he offers an eternal, consistent peace because he is the Prince of Peace. When the Prince of Peace is in, you got peace. Don't let anything rock the boat. His peace makes us praising people. His peace makes us pleasing people. He's your Yahweh Shalom. He is God of peace. When you receive Christ as Savior, you have made peace with God. As soon as you make peace with God, you can now be a bearer of the good news of the peace of God to others. 
And that's my prayer for you. That's our prayer together. Let's be bearers of good news. Good news to whom? To all people. To all people. All people can have peace with God and of God. And I hope you know that today. If you don't know that you have peace with God today, please come forward. We'll pray together. Or pray with someone right next to you. Get it right. Because he wants us to be bearers of good news. Behold. Stop looking and listen. Good news for each one of us. Let's stand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we could sing to you today. Thank you that we could hear your word Thank you, Lord, that we can be edified just by the fact that we have gathered in your name. Lord, we pray that your precious word would not just be in our head, but written in our hearts, that we would be living letters, that we would be people who are bearers of good news. Because, Lord, you know, you know how people are suffering. You know what's going on around us. You know what's going on with us, but you know what's going on around us. And we have so much to be thankful for. And we're grateful people, Lord. But let us also be people who can bless others. So thank you, Jesus. Till we meet again, Lord, as a body of Christ. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great day in the Lord. Hallelujah.